Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, uh, organizers uh, today, the Ministry of uh, Culture of Estonia, uh, the uh, European Commission, of course, and the Integration and Migration Foundation uh, for uh, bringing us together uh, oops, to discuss a, a very, very important um, seems to have a life of its own, this so we, we can slice. Very, very important uh, topic, and uh, one of the, the main uh, challenges in uh, Europe today, not just in Estonia, but uh, my reference in my presentation this morning will be to a much larger set of issues that are affecting the European uh, continent. Uh, in fact, I believe that the, the movement of people uh, whether we are talking about uh, immigrants or refugees or asylum seekers or ordinary people is one of the current greatest challenges to the stability of European societies in the 21st century. Because cohesion uh, is not only being tested in Europe by the debt crisis, and the austerity measures that are being introduced in many European countries. But there is a, a much less publicized uh, tension, a tension around uh, European borders and the uh, movement of people across these borders. And so there is a growing discourse uh, developing around the notion of European uh, diversity. And when I speak about Europe, I'm not referring any longer to the Europe of the European Union of the 27, but a much uh, larger uh, continent uh, comprising more than 800 million people, uh, including, of course, the Russian Federation, Turkey, and many, many other countries. This wider conception of Europe is extremely important uh, to focus on in this broader diversity debate. Because Europe has always been uh, a land of migration. Uh, throughout the centuries, Europe has attracted migrants, and in fact, parts of Europe have been built on the experience of migrant populations. Uh, now almost all European states are net uh, immigration countries and most countries have experienced significantly increased migration since the 1990s. So the fact is that in Europe we have a world, uh, a world in one continent and this does offer uh, many, many challenges as well as opportunities in our discussions of how to manage this complexity of, of diversity. The figures of Eurostat in 2010 indicate that there were 47.3 million foreign-born residents representing about just under 10% of the European population. Uh, approximately 6.5% of the EU population are foreign nationals. 63.4% uh, of EU residents who were born abroad came from highly developed countries. However, unlike countries of immigration of the New World, such as uh, the United States, uh, Australia, and Canada, New Zealand, certain countries in Europe have found it difficult to come to terms with the fact of migration. And many sections of uh, European societies have been <coughs> reluctant to welcome and incorporate migrants especially migrants coming from non-OECD countries 
that are perceived as having significantly different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. So there is a great deal of hostility. The hostility is growing, and uh, we cannot ignore this. The pattern of European integration has uh, significantly changed in terms of countries of origin. The composition of European migration flows have altered. For example, from the 1960s and 1970s, at that period, most of the foreign population in Western Europe consisted of migrants from Southern Europe, uh, Italians, Greeks, and Spanish. Uh, then after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, migration in the 1990s was largely east to west. But now, uh, the citizenship of foreigners residing in the EU overall, as you'll see from this, are dominated by people of Turkish, uh, Moroccan, Albanian, Chinese, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, Algerian, and Indian origin. Uh, different countries in Europe have uh, experienced slightly different patterns. Uh, for example, the Iraqis and Afghans in Denmark and Sweden, the uh, Russians in uh, Estonia and Finland, the Turks in Germany, the Romanians in Hungary, the Albanians in Italy, the Angolians in Portugal, the Indians and Pakistanis in the UK. Uh, in, in Estonia, uh, the number of immigrants <coughs> in comparison to many other uh, European uh, countries is small. Uh, in terms of minorities, as you know, the, the largest is Russian. And in terms of recent migration, the most important countries of origin are Russia and Finland. And I, I'm going to come back to this point uh, a little uh, later on. <coughs> it's a fact that most uh, European foreign-born citizens are uh, concentrated in cities. Uh, in certain cities, uh, such as uh, Rotterdam, Geneva, uh, Luxembourg, London, Marseille, half or more of the resident population is foreign-born, with some neighborhoods in those cities uh, reaching up to two-thirds. And for many cities, this change has been very uh, rapid. For example, uh, 20 years ago, Oslo in Norway had less than 2% foreign-born residents, whereas today it has 27%. In Barcelona, uh, the number has risen from 2% to 15% in only seven years. The management of uh, public attitudes uh, to diversity is very complex and uh, political debates and xenophobic discourse that inflame public opinion are very difficult to control. Uh, one can recall the debate in France about the wearing of the burqa in, uh, in public or the violence in uh, Germany between extreme right-wing and extreme uh, Islamist groups, the Southists. Uh, one still remembers the caricatures in Denmark that led to a crisis between Denmark and the Islamic world in 2005. Uh, more recently, there was the uh, trial of Anders Breivik in Oslo, who shot uh, 85 young people in a youth gathering in Norway in 2011. In some European states, uh, a dominant issue is certainly the integration of Muslim uh, residents, where certain Islamic beliefs and practices have been viewed by the majority as being incompatible with uh, liberal democratic and human rights standards. 
resulting in the populist targeting of Muslim communities. And Muslim communities are also very sensitive to this kind of criticism. Just look at the uh, reaction to the uh, recent uh, American uh, amateur film uh, denigrating uh, Prophet uh, Mohammed, which incited protests in many cities, including in Paris just a few uh, days ago, uh, a film which is viewed as highly offensive. So this is a very complex uh, issue, and no country is immune to racist incidents. In, in Estonia, uh, the Bronze Night in 2007, and the ensuing <coughs> disturbances related to the uh, relocation of the Bronze Soldier in Tallinn were provocative. Uh, according to the results of a special Eurobarometer survey in 2009, 41%, 41% of Estonian respondents believed that ethnic discrimination is widespread in Estonia. So this is the reason why that integration policies in certain countries, the traditional integration policies have in certain countries reached their uh, limitations. And there is now a drive uh, across uh, Europe to reconsider, to review, and to look at alternative uh, strategies. Many, um, there are many uh, strong and sometimes divisive deba debates, uh, very different uh, views about integration that are taking place in countries. I, I can only cite three, in the UK, in France, and in Germany, three large uh, countries uh, where although uh, integration efforts in the past have been based largely on a premise of human rights and welfare support to migrants, there is now a very divided uh, public opinion about how much effort should be made to help those in need. And there are, is a, a growing number of anti-immigrant opinion leaders who are increasingly portraying uh, economic refugees as a burden on the state, and often as a cultural threat as well. Stories which are fed uh, to the media and then are communicated very widely across our general publics. Uh, as the opening speaker said, uh, there are many uh, local contexts in discussing this debate, and uh, one can't talk about integration strategy on a pan-European basis without really focusing on the local histories and, and contexts. But although we're unable to do that, I want to um, summarize uh, several of the main policy frameworks uh, that have been developed in European uh, countries concerning uh, education, concerning integration. Looking at the older approaches, the former approaches, uh, one here I will call the integration policy of not having a policy. No policy. Um, and this in certain countries, not so much anymore, was where migrants were regarded as irrelevant or some kind of transient uh, phenomenon with no lasting impact. Um, there has been no need to welcome them uh, and therefore there has been no need to formulate any specific policy. They come and they go. Uh, no policy. Second historic policy, which is still uh, the basic policy in many uh, countries of the world, is something which I'm calling a guest worker uh, policy, where uh, migrants are regarded as a temporary uh, labor force whose members will eventually return to the countries of uh, origin. And so 
policy is seen as very short term and uh, determined to minimize the impact of migrants on the rest of the population. They are workers on construction sites, and catering outlets, often uh, low paid, uh, but they have no real impact and there's no need to look at any form of, of integration. These are two older approaches. Looking at it uh, slightly, more, more, slightly more recently, a third policy approach adopted by a number of countries, uh, particularly France, France is probably most noted for this, is a, a policy which I'll call an assimilationist policy. A policy where migrants are accepted as permanent, but uh, where it is assumed that they will be absorbed as quickly as possible into the general population. So differences from uh, generally accepted cultural norms are not encouraged and they may even be uh, discouraged or suppressed if they are considered a threat to the integrity of the state. Another example of a policy, another strategy, I'm going to call the multicultural policy. Very uh, fashionable now. Uh, the UK is probably one of the countries where this has been uh, most uh, developed. And a multicultural policy represents, so it's where migrants are accepted as permanent, and their uh, differences from the norms of the host community are encouraged and protected in law, with an acceptance of the fact that in some uh, circumstances, this may lead to certain separate or segregated uh, development. This is an acceptable uh, outcome of such a policy, multicultural policy. It's interesting that uh, in many countries, uh, they are now questioning the validity of this policy, which is multicultural, which is proved in certain countries to be equally uh, divisive. But now, uh, we are beginning to experience a relatively uh, new approach. Uh, a new approach, which uh, I will call in this discussion today, an intercultural integration model. And here, the uh, distinction uh, between uh, multicultural and intercultural becomes rather important and is an extreme challenge in certain languages where there is no distinction between these two terms. So there is always confusion between uh, the interpretation of multiculturalism and the move towards a more integrated interculturalism. And so I want to spend a, a few minutes to explain this distinction because it's very important. Uh, Intercultural policies are policies where migrants are accepted as being permanent. And while their rights to their own differences are recognized in law and recognized in uh, institutions, there is an emphasis and encouragement of policies and activities that create a, a common ground, mutual understanding, uh, empathy and shared uh, aspirations and which communicates strongly the importance of the value of diversity for society. I'm going to come back to, to that point in a few moments. Which means that there, there is a, being encouraged a, a synergy, a mixing, a, a highly integrated form of living together and, and working together. So the emphasis is on living together, not just, not just side by side. Here is a, another a quick summary of those uh, approaches. You'll see on the left-hand side the approaches that I've just uh, mentioned to you. 
and uh, across the uh, top, horizontally, are the ways in which uh, these particular policies have been inter interpreted in, uh, in terms of, uh, of government uh, policy and, and, and legislation. And you'll see from this chart that uh, although the protection in terms of rights, economic rights, uh, civic and social rights, cultural rights, are, are quite important in relation to a number of these uh, models, the uh, intercultural model, the intercultural model, places stress on a community building. Community building and cohesion that goes beyond the measures to combat discrimination. And goes beyond simply principles of equality. The focus is on the ways and means all people in a community can live together. As I said, not just side by side. Uh, these typologies here, for the sake of this presentation, I dramatically simplified. It's much more uh, complicated than this, and many of these policies uh, overlap, and they certainly don't represent all of the policy models that are available for, for integration. And it should also be uh, recognized that some states may adopt different policy approaches towards new and uh, traditional uh, migrants. For example, there may be uh, historic and legal recognition of the rights of uh, traditional migrant or minority groups to retain their own distinctive language, for example, and indeed even schools, um, while the expectation of new immigrants arriving from other countries is that they should assimilate quickly and totally. So one could have, in any given state, a, a number of policies, not quite contradictory, but uh, quite different in terms of their objective. Um, there exists, in Estonia, for example, uh, it's interesting that the legislation does not use a definition of a migrant or migrant worker. This is a very specific approach, not only uh, unique in Estonia, there are a number of, of countries that adopt the same uh, definitions. There exists the concept of uh, a third country national, as you know, and in most cases no difference is made in relation to the reasons of, of immigration. Uh, there's also a distinction between so-called two groups, uh, the so-called uh, old immigrants who arrived during the, the Soviet period or earlier, and recent immigrants who arrived in Estonia after, after 1991 and who are a rather heterogeneous uh, group of people. Um, in Estonia, uh, I know that now there are particular issues that affect perhaps the more visible migrants from uh, Africa and Asia, who although may be very small in number, may have significant problems with integration and employment that are rather different to the, the Russian immigrants. So it requires an element of, of nuance in terms of looking at, at integration policy in each country. So we are looking, uh, and I'm advocating, trying to uh, offer a new paradigm for uh, integration that balances uh, rights based approaches and a fight against discrimination with a solid discourse around what I want to call the advantage of diversity. Managing diversity as an opportunity. And uh, this means shifting away from uh, depicting migrants as vulnerable groups in need of uh, protection and support to viewing migrants as a, key, as a key to the positive development and prosperity of the entire community. And this uh, shift in policy and attitude will be increasingly important, uh, bearing in mind, first of all, uh, Europe's aging societies and the significant flow of young migrants, 
in a globally integrated economy, uh, European growth will depend on its uh, demography and on attracting talent from abroad. Recent predictions is Europe will lose a further 52 million workers by 2050. This is a quite a kind of significant uh, number. So it will be essential uh, that countries open up to the idea of uh, migrant immigration to fill very important gaps in the uh, IT sector, in engineering, in construction, in parts of tourism and catering, in healthcare systems, doctors and nurses and teachers. This will all be very, very important. So without a, a new policy to integration, it's going to be extremely difficult to, to achieve this. Now, many uh, European um, countries have done uh, uh, research and EU-wide research, uh, the evidence shows uh, significant advantages to uh, the notion of, of, of migrant involvement and diversity as it contributes to prosperity, to creativity, to growth, to productivity, to higher wages, um, and even to foreign trade. There needs to be more evidence gathered with regard to this, but there is some evidence which is pointing in this uh, direction. So how can a country realize a diversity advantage? Uh, one pilot project um, that is now jointly financed by the Council of Europe and the European Union focuses on cities, cities as laboratories uh, to demonstrate the impact of intercultural policies. Um, this is, project is called the Intercultural Cities uh, and currently has uh, 21 cities as, as members. Uh, including, in addition to a further four, 40 associated cities that are using similar approaches and, and methodologies. And these cities, uh, the pilot cities, um, exchange good practice and uh, common strategies. They have developed tools and models that promote this concept of the advantage of diversity while taking into account the very specific individual context and history of each city and the differences between these uh, cities. Not yet uh, an Estonian uh, city in this, in this project. In addition to this, uh, there are four national networks of intercultural cities uh, developed in Italy, Spain, uh, Norway and the Ukraine, which is also looking at uh, local policies matched with national policies supported by uh, national authorities. Uh, among the, the many practical tools uh, developed by the Intercultural Cities Project is an index uh, that has been created over the last two years to measure progress, to monitor the impact of changes, to facilitate the review of new policies, to uh, enable a kind of benchmarking or bench learning. And this also provides uh, city by city uh, reports to enable uh, political leaders and civic managers and researchers to monitor the effectiveness of their uh, policies at, at, a, at a local level. Uh, there's a, certainly a growing demand, uh, both within Europe, many, many cities want to, to, to join this project, but also outside, cities in North America, Central and Latin America, in Asia, uh, so they can benefit uh, from this expertise and use similar approaches and tools to promote intercultural integration. Uh, the results of this project, which are all recorded on a website, which I'll give you the address at, at the end, uh, are really inspiring. But these, these results are only, uh, only reflect one stage of a, a much longer term uh, process leading to better ways of strengthening uh, uh, community cohesion and improving the social, economic, and cultural well-being of Europeans, wherever, wherever they were were born. Uh, this conference is, is about the uh, cultural component of integration strategies. And uh, I just want to really finish in my last uh, few minutes uh, focusing on this, because uh, this area, this component has been significantly uh, underdeveloped uh, on a national and local basis with regard to promoting uh, integration. And as I said before, there's simply no national model uh, across
across Europe that can be replicated in all countries. However, I think we now need to pay far more attention to these cultural components of integration policy with a focus on interaction, interaction and uh, cohesion. And uh, I'm going to mention uh, there are many, many actions that could be undertaken on a national uh, level, but uh, I just want to mention uh, a few of these, these actions which uh, might be considered by those in responsible positions for managing such uh, policies. One I've mentioned already, uh, promoting a very significant shift in the perception of diversity, not as a threat, but diversity as an asset to be recognized, to be valued, to be cherished, and placing a much more emphasis on actions and measures that will help to avoid segregation and foster mixing, mixing in the public realm, focusing on common values and encouraging working towards common goals across all sections of the community, regardless of national or, or origin language or, or, or religion. And I'm seeing now a shift away from what was known as targeted policies to help very specific uh, migrant groups to a much more cohesive policy which affects the entire community. It's a shift in, in emphasis. Another proposed action is including, uh, trying to ensure a very, very strong approach to the inclusion of migrants in the core institutions of society, rather than special policies directed towards any particular group. And this should include equipping uh, migrants with the tools to participate in these main institutions, including language training, uh, scientific and technical knowledge to uh, access the labor market, uh, special cultural programs and organizations developed solely for migrants as a target group have proven to be less of less importance. Special cultural groups that are being formed for uh, very particular minorities of less importance in terms of successful cultural integration compared to the participation of migrants and their children in general institutions open to all. This is a very, very large shift in, in mentality and, and government uh, programs. Another uh, action, last few actions, uh, special focus should be placed on, on children uh, with a review of current educational practices, including the role of parents in schools. Uh, this has proved in many countries to be extremely effective in terms of promoting and fostering this, this whole uh, different approach to integration. Uh, more responsibility and attention given to local authorities, to cities, in fostering integration through very proactive policies that are applied across all of their services, services which are managed by cities, so housing, planning, social services, policing, uh, education, so culture, uh, these, this city, local, local uh, policy becomes an important part of the, the policy mix. The media, the media are key to promoting equality, tolerance and, and diversity, um, and especially promoting the issue of the value of diversity for society. Um, Based on a few remarks I made earlier, a special consideration should be given to issues that arise in communities where there are growing Muslim populations due to immigration. Uh, Islam should be given a place parallel to that given to Christian churches and Jewish communities. And, uh, of course, exchange of experience and good practice models between national, regional, and local bodies in relation to cultural integration. This is a very, very important uh, step, and with the sharing of results and impacts to determine next actions to be taken, which is why this conference is extremely important in that, in that regard. There are many, many other uh, actions. I've only mentioned a few of these to, to stimulate uh, debate. So diversity is uh, Europe's identity. Uh, most of those people who come to Europe in recent decades and their descendants are here to stay. And many remain uh, attached 
to the cultural heritage of their countries of origin. So as long as they uh, obey the law, uh, people who come and live in a new country should not be expected to leave their faith, their culture, uh, their identity behind. But everyone should view these as distinct assets. Indeed, this is the uh, diversity that can contribute to the creativity that Europe now needs. And to achieve that, uh, now is an opportune time to recognize the greater importance of culture to integration policy, both at national levels, but also in our cities and towns. And this is the challenge that uh, each of us, that all of us, now need to uh, face up to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. And now we have still time, 10 minutes or so, for questions and comments, uh, please, audience, in any language. There's translation. Yeah, please, and uh, there will be a microphone too, so please speak to the microphone because of the translation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paco Holbander, and I'm uh, Head of Strategies for Democracy and Diversity in the Municipality of Sudetalia. I would like to ask you, you said you had a very nice, uh, interesting figure there. You said we will lose a further 52 million workers by 2050. How, um, I know that it's probably from the Eurostat, but is it retirement only, or that people are also maybe uh, <laughs> escaping Europe? Yeah. A very interesting uh, question. The answer to that is uh, it is a combination of an aging uh, population, uh, increasing aging population, and outward immigration, uh, particularly caused by uh, the European economy as uh, people are seeking jobs in other countries, most notably Asia, Asia, Asia China, uh, uh, India, and, uh, and South America. Uh, if one looks at the outflows where there are huge opportunities, particularly in business and entrepreneurs, and this aging uh, population uh, already is beginning to de-skill at certain uh, occupations. Um, uh, one looks, for example, at the uh, doctors and nurses in, in, in certain uh, the, 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 the healthcare systems uh, in certain countries are completely dependent on external immigrants. Uh, caregiving, care assistants, uh, people who are, are working sometimes on public uh, transport, uh, catering, uh, restaurants. Uh, these, these are jobs which uh, local people, uh, nationals, are no longer either prepared to accept or where the economy can no longer justify a level of wage which is needed to survive in this country. So this is driving those people either out or into other jobs, leaving the huge uh, problems in, in gaps in, in the existing workforce. Thank you. More questions? Comments? Please. Everybody. While people are thinking, I'm asking a question of my own. Uh, listening to your talk about um, this intercultural integration, where the concept of uh, community building is a center. But most of your kind of policy recommendations, so to say, go for the society or the majority. How majority should view diversity and minority. But we know also that the problems are that the minorities also don't accept this kind of um, plurality view. What are the arguments to, uh, for, for the minorities to accept the diversity? Because it's very often that they don't accept the European values, <coughs> and this accelerates the conflict. So how to work on this uh, side of it? Yeah, very, very important uh, question. And as I mentioned, uh, there are no simplistic, quick fix uh, solutions. I mean, advocating changing views across the entire society, majority and minority. And often the best way to do that is working intergenerationally. So uh, a primary focus on children, the uh, work in schools, the promotion of a range of activities that uh, try to promote the value of this, of this mixing and this integration. And, uh, individual communities who are used to keeping to themselves begin to recognize the value importance in this 
kind of mixing. But even uh, the intergenerational difficulties that occur between first, second, and third generation migrants, even that within one group uh, becomes a, a huge problem to, to manage. So this is a, a very long-term uh, strategy, and that's why uh, if national authorities and local authorities really are serious about this, and for economic reasons, I try to argue that it's absolutely essential to be serious in relation to this, then we're talking about 20, 30 years of, of further development to change those particular views. Thanks. More comments on this? Yeah, please. And the microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Sam Zemi from Belgium. Um, I had a question on uh, the number of actions you propose in, in, in the framework of intercultural policy. It seemed very interesting to me. Um, but living together, building cohesion, etc., is not only um, a thing that we want, it's also something that we need to work on on other levels, not just the uh, the willingness of people to live together, to dialogue, to debate, to, uh, to make cohesion, but to enforce certain realities on the ground also. People, I, I don't like to speak of segregation in Europe in the sense that it's not wanted. Huh? Um, people live together, migrants live together because they, they arrived there in the 70s and the, in the 60s and the 70s because there was poor housing, social housing, and they stay there because they're in a generational poverty um, system. And it's very difficult to get out of it. Now, is it possible only to foster community cohesion without also addressing these issues of housing policy, for example? Absolutely not. I think this is a, such a key, uh, key point that because of the, the very specific focus of this very particular conference, uh, I've skewed these act, focused the actions very much on this. But there must be a fully integrated approach quite clearly with regard to poverty reduction, uh, employment uh, creation, uh, skills training, uh, uh, rethinking of education, all these become absolutely critical components. And in most national authorities, uh, there is not a kind of holistic, integrated, transversal approach to integration. I deeply regret this. So you have immigration authorities sometimes linked to uh, ministries of the interior, Ministers uh, of Foreign Affairs, you know, that have very, very specific uh, policies with regard to this. You have ministries focusing on economic development and employment with other strategies. Um, you have the local authorities, the cities themselves, that are trying desperately to deal with the day-to-day -day issues in certain communities of increasing uh, crime and increasing uh, poverty of a dramatic scale in, in, in some cases. Uh, without this kind of integration. So I think your point is extremely important, probably more important than many of the points that I make, it is the, the, the necessity of a, a broad-scale, uh, multi-disciplinary approach to integration. Because without solving those fundamental issues, uh, living together just becomes a fanciful, cozy, smug uh, concept which will never be realized. It will require a lot of very hard, hard measures. Uh, yeah, Hello, my name is Vitek Kmanowski. I'm uh, from the Aerospace Foundation, which is a Warsaw-based NGO working with uh, immigrants. And um, well, I, I really appreciate the vision you, you, you just presented. And, um, but as you say, for example, uh, hard measures, what we should do. Uh, well, the vision, I think it's really something which could be a base of maybe the one part of the base of the values for future federation transformed from Europe and Union. <laughs> but then, okay, uh, but it would be great to hear a little bit more about some kind of the first steps to be taken, not just a big, great vision, but what should be done. For example, you showed that present, we presented this intercultural cities uh, project where in Poland there is only Lublin, I think, participating. I quite closely work in Lublin in cultural sphere. And I just don't see any evidence of this program. No, but maybe I'm missing something, but I would, well, I would like to hear from you a, bit, a little bit about some kind of uh, instruments, practical instruments, or the first steps to be taken, you know, about uh, how to transform the reality <laughs> to the vision, the first steps. Yeah, please try to be short, because we have run out of time. Okay. It's a very, very question short. was so <laughs> fundamental. <laughs> 
A very short answer to this is the project which I mentioned is entirely a pilot project and the cities which joined it were the cities that expressed a very firm interest in uh, developing policies based around this notion, this vision of intercultural integration. Some cities have been more successful than others and you'll see the reports of these cities, these 21 and there's a further 40 and it's growing all the time you know, on, the, uh, on, our, on our website which shows those cities that are making more advances and trying to assess the reasons why. Uh, our work now is very much on a local basis. Uh, we are trying desperately to interest national authorities in, in perhaps undertaking similar uh, exchanges and developing a similar network of, of exchange based on, on, these, on these policies. But it's still relatively a new, new concept and a new initiative. Yeah, we have a lively discussion, but the time is also going. So thank you, Mr. Palmer, once more. And thank you.